I'd start off with some statistics of the tribunal, because I know there's been some discussion publicly about these. And every year the tribunal publishes statistics, um, and they are part of the official statistics that the Ministry of Justice gather and they publish. And um, there's been lots of discussion about what these statistics are, and I'm happy to answer questions on them later. But if you will see, um, if we look down the bottom of this table, can you all see that quite clearly? Um, that actually there has been a rise again in the number of appeals registered at the tribunal over the last year that we've got official figures on. Remember the year goes from uh, September through to the end of August. So these figures take us to the end of August 2016. What I can tell you is that trend is continuing. So at the moment we're roughly just under 30% more appeals now than we were this time last year. Now that may change because um, in the tribunal there's always been a very big pattern of highs and lows throughout a year, especially when you came up to secondary transfer around the February deadline, then obviously in the two months after that there would be more appeals, and now because we've got two deadlines, we've got the February deadline for secondary transfer, and we've also got the March deadline for going into FE provision, that's elongated the process. Um, and we actually never really came out of that role last year in the tribunal. However, the number of registrations of appeals are still going up. And I'm really only talking about appeals. I'm not talking about claims of disability discrimination. They remain roughly around the same, slightly up, but roughly around the same. But I'm really going to talk about appeals. So, um, types of appeal, always an interesting statistic. And actually, they're very much, as we've always seen, with the bulk of the appeals that are actually registered uh, against decisions made by local authorities referring to refusal to assess or reassess. So that's always been the bulk, and it remains the bulk. Then, then we have all the different types of content appeals, and what I'm looking at in those are appeals that are against Part B, which should describe each and every special education need a child has, or a young person, um, F, which is the provision that should be specified to meet each and every one of those needs, and I, which is placement, which can be a school placement, or it can be an FE college placement, or an alternative placement. So you can see they're very much the same as they already have been, always have been. The only appeal that seems slightly down is the amendment after annual review, and that's because we feel that a lot of that is coming in into context because the only reviews are being used to actually transition statements into plans. So instead of having the right of appeal after the annual review, the right of appeal tends to be more around contents of a plan because you've done that transition. Likewise, the cease to maintain statements or plans, a lot of those decisions are being picked up when a statement is transitioned from a statement into a plan. We have had very few cease to maintains around EHC plans, but they are slightly increasing, and we'd expect that to increase over the next few years as plans have been issued, and then potentially they need to be ceased, not lapsed, they're being ceased. So um, we, it's exactly as we would expect, um, but contents, contents including placement particularly, are very much our bread and butter at the Centre Tribunal at the moment. They always have been, but they continue to be so. Now, <clears throat> outcomes of appeals is always interesting. The D stands for decided, and the W is withdrawn or slash consent order issued. And you need to know the difference between these withdrawals and consents, and I'll come on to that at a moment. But actually, the proportion of appeals that we are being asked to decide have gone up marginally compared in previous years. So we're getting more appeals registered, and then there's a higher percentage of those appeals that are actually going to hearings and we're being asked to decide. So that's a slightly new trend. We're watching it because it may not be a trend. It may be something that goes away, but that's what the statistics are telling us at this moment in time. When you have an appeal registered at the tribunal, a local authority can, up to the moment that it responds to the tribunal, actually concede a tribunal hearing. So a concede is something different from when a parent then withdraws a uh, hear um, an appeal or they actually then ask for a consent order to be made. And something that's quite often confused by parents and by local authorities is you can only concede as a local authority up to the time that you're about to 
um, putting your, your response to the appeal. But after that time, the only way that the actual hearing of the appeal can be settled is either by parents withdrawing that appeal or by a request for a decision being made by the tribunal, and that can be in response to a request for a consent order. So you come to us and you say, we've settled all the issues in the appeal, this is our final working <coughs> document, or you know, we've agreed that we're going to assess, or whatever the decision is, and we'd like you to issue a decision to confirm that and issue a consent order. That means it's a decision by the tribunal, and that means that legally it has to be acted on by the local authority within the statutory time frame. If that doesn't happen and a parent withdraws the appeal, there's no automatic um, clicking in of those statutory deadlines. And we're sometimes getting issues where parents have been told by advisors, maybe the local authority, maybe they've just done it themselves, they've withdrawn an appeal, and then for whatever reason something doesn't happen, and there's no legal backup then at that point to say, come on, you agreed to do this issue, the EHC plan or whatever it was, and you've not done it. So um, you need to be really clear the difference in our stats between decide, withdrawals or consent. Really good point to take home if you take up nothing else. So the type of common issues we're seeing in the tribunal around um, what's been going on with the, with the whole move to the new process is this, that local decisions are not being based on the actual legal test that they should apply. Um, it's something that's quite common. It's often picked up in case management if we can do that but otherwise it comes to the hearing, particularly relevant in things like refusal to assess appeals, whereby the local authority may not have been applying the law that's in uh, 36.8, um, and it doesn't look at whether the child has or may have SDN, may need an EHC plan. It looks at you know, not having £6,000, being two years behind or whatever. That's not the legal test. And so you know, what we have to say is, that when you come into the tribunal, it's the legal test that we're going to be actually applying. It's not any SEM policy that a local authority has. So we have to apply the law. And it actually helps everybody if everybody's really clear what the legal test is. So specificity, for instance, is not a new concept within the world of SEM. If you've got a plan, you have to specify child's needs, provision to meet that needs. We know that that's very clear. It's not regular speech and language or regular access to speech and language, it's whatever it is that they need. So it may be, you know, one session a term or whatever it is. So that's an issue that keeps coming up time and time again. Uh, we have issues when there's transition from a statement to an EHC plan that the actual EHC needs assessment that's required is not being carried out or not being carried out fully. And um, the Regulation 6, we're not here as the tribunal to make sure local authorities do Regulation 6. And that means by do, I mean, you know, get it right, go and get the information and advice and bring that back to the, uh, the table and make their decision based on it. But if we're being asked to review a decision um, uh, in appeal, then obviously we need the information and the evidence in order to make a decision standing in the shoes of the local authority. And that's causing some problems for us when that advice is not there. So, for instance, if it's been acknowledged that a child maybe has a... Um, issue around physiotherapy, but actually there's no advice or even up-to-date advice that's been gathered through the EHC transition process, the EHC assessment process, so we're being asked to make a decision with no evidence there at all. Uh, that's a very difficult decision for us to make, and that can delay the appeal. Um, professional reports, and I'll say something about these as well, we're very aware of the pressures on professionals but Regulation 6 does require professionals to look at the child's needs. And when I'm saying child, I'm also talking about young people here as well, I just have to point out. So child's, a child or young person's needs, the provision to meet those needs, and the outcome expected if that provision is put in place. And we expect the evidence to have that, but very often we get quite a good picture of a child's needs, but we might not get a very clear, specified picture of the provision that should be put in place and actually very rarely are we getting anything that's telling us what the outcome that should be expected from that provision being put in place, being put in place. Now the tribunal has no jurisdiction over section E of a plan, which is around outcomes, but they are relevant to us when we're looking at ceasing to maintain a plan, and they're relevant to us when we're looking at provision and progress. So if we're looking at if somebody's made progress over a period of years, or even a period of months, 
We need to know what was expected if this provision was put in place, and that is a good indicator of the report saying that. So, you know, if you're saying a child needs one hour switching language a week, um, and that's because they have a defined need, then you need to tell us what you would expect to be the outcome of that provision being put in place. We're getting some issues around the move into FE, and these are increasingly part of our work. <coughs> There's very big issues around five-day-a-week provision. And we're very clear, five-day-a-week provision doesn't have to be with an educational provider only or one educational provider, but we do have to see some evidence of a package that is over social care and also education as well. And very often, things are brought to us and we may have, for instance, a young person wanting to go to a college for five days a week, and the alternative that the local authorities are arguing is appropriate is three days a week in an FE college, but nobody can tell us from the local authority what's proposed for the other two days a week. And we do need that information. It can be social care <coughs> placement, that's absolutely fine, but what it can't be is nothing. So we do really need to know what we're proposing for the other two days a week, um, and it could be a combination of many different things, but. Nothing is not an alternative, especially when they're over 18, over 19. And certainly one of the things that concerns us where there's an expectation that a parent is not going to um, work or is going to be providing that, when that's not necessarily what the parent wants to do. Um, so I think that's one thing that's coming up increasingly for us. Um, and the last point on here is local authorities not being clear in a comparison of costs. And the cost to the local authority is the cost of the education and or the social care placement compared with the equivalent of what the parent or the young person is wanting to be named in, in section I. And I'm talking to you all at a level that I wouldn't necessarily do so if I didn't think you knew and um, was following what I'm saying. You can ask me any questions if you don't understand what I'm, what I'm saying. But um, what I'm, what's happening with the comparison of costs is that people are not giving us clear costs in their arguments about placement, or if the costs are there, they're not giving us the full cost. They may only be giving us the education costs or part of costs. They're not giving us the full picture. So that's causing us some issues. The one final, final point I haven't put on the slide is this, is we're still dealing with the actual format of these EHC plans not being legally compliant. And I'm very concerned that that's still happening so far into the process and particularly where local authorities emerge in sections E, F, and H1, H2, for instance, we as a tribunal only have jurisdiction over certain sections of the plan, and if you merge them all in together, it makes it very difficult to work out what you're actually proposing as a provision. Um, and so I would make a real plea to you that if you think that the formats of your plans are not legally compliant, and by that I mean they should have separate sections, not merged into each other, separate sections in the plan, then you could always come and ask the tribunal for advice on that, either in a hearing or separately through our user groups, because I think it's really important to try and tackle this issue. It can't still be going on two years, nearly two years into the process. We need to sort this out, because if it's not clear to us in the tribunal, and there's some extremely confusing formats out there, then it's certainly not going to be actually accessible to parents or young people either. So please I ask you to look at your plans and just make sure it's very clear to everybody who's going to do what, when and where and in what section that provision is placed or um, even what needs are placed in what area. So that's my last plea on hot issues and things that are coming through. So the recommendations pilot, for many of you um, you may know or you may not know that we were tasked at the tribunal to run a pilot which looked at not only making decisions in relation to education but making recommendations where there were issues in social care and or health. Now the pilot <coughs> opened in April 2015 and it lit, in the beginning it had 13 local authorities that had um, volunteered to be on the programme and then we've had another four join since. The pilot is now finished and we're getting together data, we're doing the last few of the pilot appeals. But it's been quite an interesting exercise. It's also been, I think, quite a successful exercise. Um, the take-up has only been 30 appeals over that period of time from those local authorities. But we did have some initial problems with some of those local authorities not telling their parents and young people they were on the, on the pilot. 
and therefore they didn't know that they could ask for recommendations to be made in health and or social care. So that was one issue to start off with. And some of the um, actual local authorities as part of the pilot, actually one of them had never had an appeal to the tribunal in the last 10 years anyway. So um, even though it was there in name, it wasn't necessarily going to be a big um, appeal registering type of uh, <laughs> issue. Um, the whole pilot has been overseen by Mott MacDonald, who have been commissioned by uh, the DfE, and there's been some assessment done by CEDA, which is part of Warwick University, and that's still in process. Local authorities were asked to inform parents and young people when they made a decision on any right of appeal except for refusal to assess, that they were part of the pilot, and if they wanted to, they could ask us to make a recommendation concerning health and social care. Um, and we, as a tribe, can also put a, a, a case onto the pilot. So if we were case managing the case, and we thought there's issues here, we can see there's really big issues, we are put them onto the pilot, that's what we did as well. Um, so as I said, we had 30 appeals from 10 different local authorities. Two were refusal to issue an EHC plan, two were ceased to maintain, and others were around the contents of the actual uh, uh, plan, as far as education was concerned. 18 raised health issues, 25 raised social care issues, of which six have now been decided, but actually seven, and I understand as of this morning, eight have been conceded by local authorities in advance of a hearing being held. Now, of those, there was quite a high percentage, I think, of young people appeals, which reflected the fact that when you move out of uh, school-based education into maybe college-based education, it's tending to be a time when people need to bring together health, education, and social care as well. And all of these appeals were case managed, and I think that's a really important point. It meant that we got parties on the phones and said, now tell us really clearly, what is your issue? What is your issue around social care? What is your issue around health? And then we looked to make sure that there was the evidence there that was needed if it went to appeal, that we can make the decision. And that meant things like directing social care to provide an up-to-date social care report, or even a social care report. It meant directing also that some of the healthcare evidence was being collected. And it's been very successful as a tool for local authorities, but also for CCGs and other parts of the local authority social care to actually get together. It's given them a reason to actually be proactive in getting together, getting the evidence, and having those discussions that they maybe have not had before through the EHC means assessment process. I think one of the things for us that we were concerned about was um, actually, you know, what would be the scope for health? Because social care and education are used to working together, they're part of the same team in the local authority, even if when you go into adult services, adult social care, you may not be within children's services, you're certainly within the local authority area. But health often is a very different beast. And in some local authorities, they may have up to seven CCGs that are working with that local authority, so kind of commissioning groups. And we've been, the feedback we've had is it's been very useful. And in fact, the health issues that have been raised when you've actually come to final appeal have been quite small and quite minimal. And a lot of them have actually settled when somebody from the CCG gets enrolled. So as for us, anecdotally, that's been very good uh, progress as far as bringing health to the table is concerned. <coughs> so the type of issues that have been presented in social care has been things like lack of social care evidence, no uh, social care assessment. Too often we see um, a response from social care that says not known to this service. And so that type of thing has been flagged up. Lack of specification of social care. So it may well be there's been a core assessment done. The evidence is all there. And it says, you know, this child gets so many hours of uh, direct payments or whatever to support them out in the community. But that's not been translated and put into the, the plan. So that was quite an easy, quick fix at that point. The big issue is around residential educational placements. So that could be either in a school or in a um, college, FE college, specialist college. So where somebody is arguing in front of the tribunal ordinarily that somebody needs a residential school placement based on the very small law or very tight focused law that we have, can only be for educational reasons, we could consider actually 
whether we could make a recommendation that education and social care can fund this together. And that's been an interesting way forward. And I think if we were looking at what happens in the future, that's certainly an area that we would do more work on. Health, we've had issues raised about CBT, um, we've had issues raised about evidence and identification of evidence from CAM, so child adolescent mental health services, and we've had continence aids. We've had lots of questions about continence aids, but it's a real issue to parents if they're not accessing the right amount of continence aids to support a young person or a child, and you know there may be policies within a local uh, CCG area that says you can't have more than four, or in one case it's four and a half a day, and we need we're like, hmm, where did the half come from? <laughs> anyway, but they're the types of issues we've been asked to look at, and on the whole, the health issues have really settled themselves, and it's been more the social care issues that we've actually had to get in and, and look at and get the evidence for. Five minutes, Jane. Right. Initial learning is, for the pilots, is positive. It's positive working between SEN and social care teams with the lo local authority. It's encouraging and fostering a holistic view health issues were not that significant and they weren't clinical issues. They weren't things that we were asked to make a clinical decision on, that's not an area we go into. We are not going to be making clinical decisions at any level, but certainly there are issues we can look at. And it's been particularly relevant for post-school FE placement issues, residential school placement issues. So some procedural changes at the tribunal. You may have noticed we're now on a 12 week timetable for all appeals. This is something that came out of requests from our user groups, from parents, and also from local authorities as well. The idea is to stand in the shoes of the local authority and review their original uh, decision making, as opposed to what has been happening in the past, everybody regrouping, getting more evidence, and having a completely different decision that we're looking to look at and make 22, 24 weeks down the line. It's also very important for children and young people to get their decisions quickly because that's an awful long time in the educational life of a child or young person. Requests for changes forms, if you use the tribunal a lot, we get an awful lot of requests for changes from people. So you put your appeal in and then you file a request for changes form. And it's always said on the form, please get the other side of you to tell us what's happened and you, nobody ever does. So we're actually getting a bit strict on this now. We're going to send them back to you as of Monday saying get the other side's views. Um, it will help us because then instead of us having to write to the other side, say what is your view, get that in, make a decision, we're telling you you've got to talk to the other side. It's a, a whole, whole new way forward for some people. But you need to ask them if you want to change something, like it's something in the timetable, ask them before you come and request us. Don't just request us and copy them in. You need to ask them. We now have refusal to assess appeals that are listed on the papers. So as standard, as long as both parties agree, they're going to be decided on the papers. This is our biggest right of appeal, and it's also the biggest right of appeal that gets conceded by local authorities in advance. Often, there is not, uh, in the original decision making, there's not a consideration, a careful consideration of the legal test which is whether the child has or may have special educational needs, may need an EHC plan. It's not the same as making the decision that a child does need an EHC plan. And actually, this point where actually, if, if you decide you're going to do one, you go off and you get the evidence, should, if you've followed through on the EHC assessment, mean you can make that decision as to whether you need the plan or not at a later date based on evidence. So we have taken them to paper. It means we can do them. You can always request an oral hearing. There's absolutely no problem with that. But it means that we can do them and we can go through them and we can get them done quickly because that is the first stage in potentially getting an EHC plan. And we want to ensure that that decision is made efficiently based on the law. Changes to come. Bundle guidance. We're reviewing our bundle guidance. We are looking to cap the number of pages that somebody can automatically send us at the tribunal in an appeal. We are increasingly getting huge bundles of papers, you know, in the thousands for something which is quite simple, where people are just throwing everything at us without thought about whether it's relevant to the legal test that we have. And this isn't just one side, both sides are doing it. 
So what we're looking is for more focused activity that people send us what is relevant to the test. If you have a 19 year old, you don't need to send us a copy of his annual review from when he was in primary school unless there's something relevant in there. So that's something that we're looking at doing. We're looking to update guidance on written evidence produced by professional witnesses to the tribunal. And um, we're going to work with other professional associations to do that, but there is nothing more um, concerning when we get two professionals reporting, one maybe from the local authority, one a privately instructed uh, professional, where one report may be 15 pages, one may be 80 pages, but none of them give us what we want. So what we want is actually identification of a child's needs, and then for every need, provision to meet that need that is specified, and we want outcomes. We want to know what you expect to happen from that provision being put in place. We have drafted some templates of questions which we will go and consult with Kate and the Association of Ed Psychs and Speech and Language Therapists, OTs, physios, and it will go out to all professionals giving us actual evidence, written evidence, in the tribunal. It may be that local authorities want to adopt it when actually getting their EHC assessments, that's entirely up to them, but what it will mean is we can see where the gaps are. We can see where somebody's very, very well looked at need, but then failed to actually specify provision. Child's right for appeal, I'm flagging this up because it was something that came in through the legislation under the Children and Families Act. Um, it needs to be piloted, and it's something we're working with the DfE on to do. It's something that's already in play in Wales, so the child in their own right has a right of appeal to the tribunal. It's envisaged that it will work, especially where a child has maybe another family member other than their parents that can take up the right of appeal. It may be they have a social worker. It may be have somebody else in their whole um, area that wants to take up the right of appeal because too often parents are not in a position to take up that right of appeal for whatever reason. It could be that schools could take that up. But it's something that's going to be explored and when we have more update, we let you know. And this is my hot tip. <laughs> know the law, apply the law. It's actually relatively simple. But I can't emphasise enough, when you come into the tribunal, it may be that you're having very hard times financially. We recognise that. But in our decision making, we cannot take account of that because we have to apply the law. And we're very aware of some of the real big issues that are going on in local authorities around resources. And that's just not money, it's actual people to do the job. But unfortunately, we're not given any leeway to say, we completely recognise the problems you've been under and that's why you've not completed this assessment or this is why you've not done this or what you've done that. We're there to apply the law and sometimes that seems very harsh because we can't take account of that wider context. It's not that we're not aware of it and it's not that we, we don't have some recognition of that, it's just when you're applying the law we cannot actually take that into account as part of our decision making. Okay, that's me done. I'm not too bad, am I, Christine? You've done very well. Yes, thank you. 